I would like to make a few uh, preface statements uh, before I get into the message this morning. Uh, this message is being recorded in an empty church. You're not going to hear any amens and laughter or interaction with the congregation. Um, I believe we need church. I believe it's important that we uh, have preaching. We need to come together in church for fellowship, for our communion that we have one with another, but we also need that time where we sit and we listen to the preaching of the Word of God. So Lord willing, each week we're going to bring these messages uh, as we move through these days of crisis. I want to encourage you and try to give you some things from the Bible that may help you as we move through this. And just like I told many of you in our email and text that oftentimes the Lord uses things that are bad for our good. We know Romans 8.28 is still in the Bible. All things work together for good to them that love God. And we know in the life of Joseph, his brothers meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so if there ever was a time in our country that we needed to pray and seek God's face, it's now. If there ever was a time in recent times, especially in our nation, where people need a wake-up call and for God to shake their world, it's now. If there ever, ever was a time as far as Christians are concerned in this Laodicean church age that we're in, that we need to get off our iPads and off our phones and away from our games and our movies and our entertainment and spend some time away from things with our families in prayer, having devotion, having some good quality time, it's now. And so hopefully you can take this time to get close to the Lord. I want to encourage you, those of you that uh, have to stay home and, and so forth, to spend time in your Bibles, to spend time seeking the Lord's face, and hopefully get some encouragement from the Scriptures. And if the Lord uh, gives you an opportunity to witness for Him, especially in this chaotic, panic-stricken world that we're in, be a good testimony for Christ. Like I told you in the email and the text, I believe that we do take church for granted. We take each other for granted. We take the fact that we're able to shake hands and kneel down by each other and pray and sing songs and hymns together and be close. We take those things for granted. And so I think when this is all said and done and it's over, we will really appreciate coming back to church again. And we will be more grateful and thankful for the blessing that God has given us here at Calvary Baptist Church. I am very thankful for this place and I'm thankful for my church family. You are a blessing to me. Um, did any of you, I'm sure you probably did, you did some panic shopping. We did some panic shopping. Um, every chance you get, you stop through a store, dollar store, grocery store to see if they have, you know, those last... Uh, minute ideas that you've had that you might need during a time like this and of course everybody's needs different you know some people it has to be another roll of toilet paper or maybe paper towels or something like that it was funny we were in the grocery store and I saw this older man he was in one of the driving things there and he had his grandson behind him in a buggy pushing a cart there and he kept saying grad dad what, el what else do we need what else do we need and I looked, and, and I'm just curious, times like this, I'm seeing what all the shoppers are buying. And I look over in the guy's buggy, and he has about 15 two-liter bottle of Cokes and sodas, and he has cookies and Twinkies and, and all kind of things. And that was his stash, I guess. Uh, so to each his own. But, um, you know, it's amazing uh, the things in this first world country that we think we can't live without. And so I just want to encourage you during this time to, um, to just try to seek the Lord's face. It's also interesting when you notice you walk outside and you see nature that the Lord has created just moving on just like normal. Just like everything is just fine. Uh, the sun rises and the sun sets just like it always has. The birds and the squirrels are out doing their thing. And the frogs and the cr crickets are whistling. The birds are singing. And it's just moving right along. And the Lord is in control of these things. So I just want to encourage you uh, about these matters. Let's open our Bibles. If you have your Bible and you'd like to turn with us to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I'd like to read a few verses here and get right into the message this morning. Today's message will be God's antidote for fear. God's antidote for fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
Verse number 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Notice verse number 7 in my text. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The intense persecution that was taking place here in the first century when Paul writes to Timothy was one that the kings had uh, put out on the Christians because of some of the plagues and things that had taken place. There was a great fire in Rome that Nero had blamed on the Christians. And persecution ensued against Bible believers. And you'll notice in this text that really the context has to do with afflictions of the gospel in verse number 8 and of Paul being locked up in jail. And he's like, look, Timothy, I don't want you to be frightened and to be so consumed and panicked with fear that something's going to happen to you because of the gospel. You need to do what's right anyway. You need to serve God anyway, even though these afflictions are going to come. I want us an application for what we're dealing with in our country and our world today to get some help from verse number 7, dealing with the idea and the theme of fear, panic, excitement, and being anxious. And this idea that this spirit has just pervaded not just the world, that's pretty understandable, but it has pervaded Christians. Christians are so anxious and afraid. And so I want us to hopefully get some help from this passage and realize that uh, the Lord is in control of things. Now think with me for just a minute. The Lord did not stop persecutions. He did not stop these afflictions that were taking place for early Christians. Trouble still came to these believers here. That does not take away the power of of God and it does not take away the reality that God is still in control. Just because people get sick and just because people die does not mean God does not care or that God is not in control. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a cursed world. We are living in a situation where sin has fallen on this race and this place is not good, this place is bad, and sin has invaded every aspect of our life. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We have disease, we have sickness, we have pandemics, we have viruses because of sin. And that doesn't mean God does not love us. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died because of the sin problem that we have. God is still in control. Don't let this shake your faith. You say, well, I prayed that so-and-so wouldn't get sick and they got sick. That doesn't mean God does not love them. And that doesn't mean that God did not hear your prayer. We have to make sure we step back and read the Bible and let the Bible's theology penetrate our emotions and our fears. Fear is a very, very real problem, especially now. Uh, years ago, there was an Ann Lander. She had a column. I don't know if she still has it in the newspapers. Years ago, when newspapers were way more popular than they are now, Ann Landers had a column and all these people would write in with their problems and their questions. And she reported that she received more than 10,000 letters a week. And she said she received more mail concerning fear than any other matter. Fear. Fear is a very real problem. Some of you watching and listening today are afraid. You are filled with fear. Julius Caesar, who supposedly was without fear and led thousands into battle, he once remarked that even the shouts of his enemy sounded like music to his ears. Yet, when it began to thunder, he would be so frightened and so afraid that people around him witnessed him shaking, literally trembling in fear. Peter the Great, the great uh, czar of Russia, was terrified to cross a bridge. They say when he put his foot on a bridge, he would actually scream out in fear. 
Evil Knievel, years ago, he was one of these daredevil devils. He would take his motorcycle and, and jump over huge ravines and do all these crazy things. He was afraid to fly on an airplane. Fear. Lewis Pasteur, and of course you know the term pasteurization. Uh, Lewis Pasteur is reported to have had such an irrational fear of dirt and infection that he refused to shake hands. He would fit very well in our current situation today. President and Mrs. Benjamin Harrison were so intimidated by the new fangled electricity that they installed in the White House that they didn't dare touch the switches. They would get a servant to come and touch the switches and turn it on. And if there wasn't a servant available to help them with that, they simply would just leave the lights on. They would not turn them off. Now, things aren't looking too great right now, and there's a lot of uh, anxiety, there's a lot of unknowns in this health crisis that we're dealing with. And by the way, let me calm the church down for just a minute. This is not a religious situation. This is not some type of thing that's taking place in our country targeting churches to sh shut churches down. This is a health crisis. Just like when you study back around World War I, 1918, 1919, after that war, you had the great Spanish flu that killed thousands. And so whenever you study that, you realize churches had to do what any type of facility does that has large gatherings. They had to close down. This is a health crisis, and many people are afraid because in our generation, we haven't face something like this where we have these restrictions placed on us and people are afraid. They're thinking, what is going on? What's going on behind the scenes? Is there an ulterior, ulterior motive? Will my freedoms be taken away? Am I going to not be able to get my medicine? What type of fear? All kind of fears. Am I going to get sick and die? Are my loved ones going to get sick and die? What is going to happen? The fears. But not just those type of fear, but spiritual Fear, emotional fears, losing that sense of normalcy, that sense of security that we have and things going along like we are comfortable with. The Lord has indeed shaken our lives. Now let me say this about fear as we think about this passage. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. However, the Bible does say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if God has not given us the spirit of fear, obviously he's not referring to that because God does expect us to have a healthy fear. There is a such thing as a healthy fear. You ought to have a holy and a healthy fear. A healthy fear would be a fear of fire. And when I go out and I light my fire outside when I'm burning limbs and so forth and that thing gets hot I step back I get away from it and when you get close to a stove you need to have a healthy fear of fire you should have a fear of things that will harm you that is healthy you should have a fear of pulling out into a road where people are doing 60 70 miles an hour fear of fire fear of storms fear of like I said crazy drivers on the road there is also a holy fear. You should fear God. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter number 12, Fear not him uh, that kills the body, but he says, Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Deuteronomy 6.13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him. A helpful fear. But there is a hurtful fear. There is fear and anxiety that literally drives you emotionally and psychologically into a frenzy. Some of the medical sciences recognize that many of our sicknesses are caused by such emotions as sorrow, envy, resent, resentfulness, hatefulness, and fear. The Greek word for fear is phobia or uh, phobos, where we get the word phobia. And someone has said there are over 700 different kinds of phobia. I'm sure I have some of these. I'll give you a few. There's claustrophobia, which is a fear of enclosed places. I'm sure maybe some of you have experienced that before. There is acrophobia, which is the fear of high places. There is ergophobia, which I believe a lot of Americans have. 
That's the fear of work. There is demophobia, the fear of crowds. There is gamophobia, the fear of marriage. There is even levophobia, the fear of things on the left side of the body. That's a strange one. A fear many people have is ecclesiophobia, ecclesiophobia which is from the word ecclesi, ecclesiolatry, which is the, the word for church, a fear of churches. There is pantophobia. You say, what's that? That's the fear of everything. And a lot of people have that. Somebody said, fear makes men believe the worst. Always thinking the worst, not just about people, but maybe about the government. Oh no, the government's out to get me. Thinking the worst about what could happen. You could get sick today. That's any day, not just during the crisis we're in. You could be in the hospital by tonight. You could get a phone call where a loved one has died. There are all kinds of possibilities of things we don't want to entertain in our mind. And if you focus on those negative things, you focus on those fears, it can be very hurtful and harmful. Uh, the Bible says whatsoever things are true and just and honest and good and of, of, of good report and virtuous, if there be any praise, think on these things. You ought to be thinking on good things, on Jesus Christ. Paul said, be simple concerning the evil. You don't need to meditate on all the sins and think about all the sins that are in the sewers of society today. You need to think on good things. Think on Jesus Christ. Think on heaven. Think on God and the blessings that he's given you. And be thankful about some things. Instead of being worried and anxious and filled with fear of what might happen. If you're so worried about what happened tomorrow, you might not do what you should do today, and therefore you will lose your sense of purpose in this life. Once you lose your sense of purpose, you're well nigh gone. And so there's a hurtful fear. Somebody said the highway of fear is the shortest route to defeat. And somebody said the greatness of our fear shows us the littleness of our faith. Fear and faith oftentimes are at complete opposite ends. You're either going to fear the Lord or you will fear man. Or if you fear man, you will not fear the Lord. You're either going to be afraid of what might happen and afraid of all the, the things out in the world that may cause your world to crumble or you're going to trust God who already knows the end from the beginning. If you're saved, you already have your name in the Lamb's book of life. If you're saved, you're already just as good in heaven with the door shut. You're either going to trust God and have faith, or you're going to be filled with fears. Romans 8, 15. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, cry Abba, Father. There's a spirit of fear that pervades our society. It also pervades, unfortunately, the lives of many, many Christians. Are you filled with fear or are you full of faith? 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We should love God, but we should also fear God. There's a balance there because God is holy. So we have a holy fear of God. He will chasten us if we're his sons. God does not tolerate sin. When something bad happens in your life, the first place to look is up. The next place to look is inside. Lord, where do I need some help? What have I done wrong? The next place to look is around. Sometimes it's some things outside of your relationship with God that's causing trouble in your life and it has nothing to do with your walk with God and then sometimes we have to look down because it comes from hell itself. You have to realize we as believers ought to exercise faith instead of fear. Fear will keep you from serving God. The context here with Timothy, Paul is trying to encourage him not to be consumed with fear so he would not shirk his duties and responsibilities in a very tense situation as far as being a Christian publicly would bring him repercussions, it would bring him persecution. And he's like, look, Timothy, you don't need to let fear get a hold of you. If fear gets a hold of you, you'll never do anything for God. It will keep you from serving God. In Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, he said, I was afraid and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. What fears do you have 
this morning? What insecurities do you have? You should have a holy fear and healthy fears. You should be afraid enough of germs and of viruses to be sensible. Don't lose your mind. Wash your hands and be safe and, and, and separate and those kind of things. But to be so consumed with fear that you're tormented, that's not from the Spirit of God. That's from the Spirit of this world. And it will literally drive you crazy. That fear is not from God. God does not give that kind of fear. We know that sin drives us into the wrong type of fear. In Genesis chapter 3, when you read the story of Adam and Eve, Eve took of the fruit and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. The Bible says, and they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. That is a result of sin. You should be running to God, not from God. When people run from God, that's the wrong type of fear. The song we sing and we love so much, and it's very true, it says this, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, but then don't leave it there. It says, "'Twas grace my fears relieved.'" There's a conviction of sin, but then there is the consoling of our sins by way of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so there's an unhealthy fear that tells us to run away from God, that says God is against us, that says that God does not want to help us. Just because God is holy does not mean you need to run away from Him. Really, it's the contrary. You are so unholy that you need to run to Him even though it's a fearful thing. Kind of like Moses and the bush is burning. He takes his shoes off. He's afraid, the Bible says, to approach unto God. That's natural. But it's also natural to run from God. And many people, because they know their sins offend God, they run from Him. They need to know there's a balm in Gilead. They need to know there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. If you are a sinner that is running from God, I want to encourage you and exhort you to run to God. Come to the foot of the cross and find forgiveness. Admit your sins, confess your sins, repent of your sins. Ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, to save you. And His blood will wash you from your sins and from your fears. You know, fear comes from the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, when he refers to the problem that a lot of people have as Christians of not forgiving one another, he says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan wants to take advantage of the Christian. The Bible says he walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's after you, and he wants to drive you in the ground of uselessness for Christ by filling you with fear. Some of you, you need to be real careful because the devil has targeted you because you're beginning to serve Christ you're beginning to get in your Bible. You're trying to seek God, and the devil wants to stop you. Some of you, you've been real faithful coming to church. You've been real faithful trying to attend, and now this has happened. Don't let the devil knock you out just because we can't have services physically where you can walk in here. Don't put your Bible down. Don't quit reading. Don't go back and just spend extra time watching the news. Get the updates, but leave it. The devil will take advantage of you. The world, the news media will continue to um, motivate you to keep watching to take advantage of you. Be careful about this. Not just fear from the world and the devil, but also from our own flesh. I mentioned before that sense of things being normal, that sense of stability that we have. I'm a man of routine. I'm sure many of you are People of routine, you like things to go along, and now our world has been kind of rattled. Things have changed. <coughs> Excuse me, and now we have to deal <coughs> with that change, 
And we have to understand that that sense that we have to preserve ourselves and to find some stability in and of ourselves is a dangerous place because it's not founded on God. It's founded on pride. And that's dangerous. The sense of self-preservation. The fear of losing control. Some of you, you have to control everything. OCD, I think they call it. You've got to control your life and not only your husband's wife or your wife's life or your kid's life or the people that work with you's life or whoever. You've got to control everybody and everything. Here's the news I want to let you in on here. You're really not controlling as much as you think you are. You say, well, I'm healthy and I eat right. You could have some kind of problem in your body that you're not even aware of. Life as we're learning in this crisis, life is so very fragile. You want to be careful of being driven by fear of trying to preserve and hold on to what you think you have. The idea of self-preservation, do whatever I have to do to stay alive and to preserve my way of life. There was a farmer, he had been involved on an in an accident and what had happened is he had his mule loaded up in his trailer and he had been going down the road and this huge Mack truck tractor trailer deal ran through a stop sign and hit him and his truck and his trailer and um, literally threw him out of the vehicle. His mule was knocked out of the, uh, the, tra the trailer and there he is laying there. And the uh, highway patrol comes up and investigates and so on and so forth. And so after this thing's all over, he actually sues the company of the man who has this tractor-trailer company. He sues the company, takes them to court, and they're there in the courtroom. And the man's on trial, and the judge is there, and, and the man's being questioned by the uh, attorney of the big corporation of the tractor-trailer company. And he's like, look, uh, Mr. So-and-so, um, here you are. I have the police report here. You told the highway patrolman that you were fine. And so the man started into his story. He says, yes, but let me tell you about my old mule, Betsy. My old mule, Betsy. No, sir, hold on a second. I'm reading the report. You told us and you told the officer here that you were fine. And he says, well, let me explain here. My, my, my favorite mule, Betsy, I had to get her down to the vet. And the lawyer lets in again and tries to get him back to the point. Look, did you or did you not say you're fine? The judge says, hold on a second. I want to hear about this mule. So he lets the old man tell his story. And the old man says, thank you, judge. And he says, my favorite mule, my old mule, Betsy, I had to take her to the vet. And I'm going down the road and this huge tractor trailer crosses the, runs through the stop sign and hits my truck, throws me on one side, throws my mule out on the other side, and I'm laying there in awful pain and I don't even want to move. I hear my old mule Betsy moaning and groaning and crying out and I'm trying to move and I want to get over there to see her and see how she is. Then I hear the patrolman come up and uh, he goes over there and I hear, he hears obviously the moaning and groaning of the mule and I hear two shots and then I don't hear the mule groaning and moaning anymore. And he comes over to me and I'm over there all in a panic hurting and moaning and he asks me, he says, hey, I saw how bad your mule was and I uh, took care of her for you. How are you feeling? He says, I'm feeling fine. I'm feeling fine. Self-preservation. And so when you think about your life and you think about what you are used to and how everything's going along, that fear of your world being uprooted and changed can drive you into a frenzy psychologically, mentally, and spiritually. What kind of fear do you have? Do you have the right kind of fear or do you have the wrong kind of fear? Notice the contrast in our verse, verse number 7. God hath not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Notice, God hath not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and of a sound mind. There's a contrast here. God has given us power to conquer our fears. This affects our will. This affects our motivation here. 
1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You see, this power is of power beyond man's power. This is God's power. When Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You remember when Jesus Christ was walking out on the water and the disciples thought they saw a spirit? He said, it is I, be not afraid. When John saw the glorified Christ in Revelation chapter number 1 and he laid there as dead, Jesus Christ came and put his hand on him and said, fear not. The power to overcome our fears is supernatural. And God has given that. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Romans chapter 8, If the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, He shall quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. He tells the Thessalonians over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, He says to the Thessalonians who are in God. If you're saved, God is in you and you're in God. You are plugged in to supernatural power that can conquer your fears. You may think just humanly speaking, if you face a tragedy, maybe something similar in this very crisis that we are in, you say, what am I going to do if this affects my loved one? What am I going to do if this takes someone dear to me? What am I going to do if this gets me? You have to realize God has given you power to conquer that. It's not of human ability, it's of supernatural ability. He will not let anything happen to us that he's not in control of. You say, how do you believe that? You believe it by faith. You have to not only realize the scripture says that he loves us, but you have to know that he loves you. Paul said, I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We have eternal salvation. When you trusted Christ, he saved you then and there with an everlasting salvation. You're plugged into eternity. No past, no present, no future. Eternity. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can't go to hell. The worst thing that can happen to you if you're saved is you die and go to heaven. People say, well, they're threatening me with this and threatening me with that, and this problem may come. What, are they going to threaten you with heaven? As Christians, we are more than conquerors, Paul says, through him that loved us. Power to conquer our fears. This affects the will. Notice love to calm our fears. This affects our heart and our affections. We need not only to be motivated and to have a will to act and to do and to plow through things, you can't always get over things, but God can give you power to get through things. But we need to have love. We need to have affection. We need to have a calmness. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. I quoted it earlier, but perfect love casteth out fear. And then notice verse number 7, and of a sound mind. This commits our fears to him. This concerns our thoughts. He's given you a sound mind. I want to deal with spiritual things because I'm a preacher. I'm not a psychologist. That's not in what my field is an expert in. And I'm not an expert in the Bible. But as a preacher, I want to tell you the Scripture says that God has given you a sound mind. Now, that's God's part, but then we have our part. You can't just take one verse and divorce the rest of Scripture from that. You have to realize the Bible also says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3, whose mind is stayed on thee. God's part, our part. God's responsibility, our responsibility. D.L. Moody's favorite verse was Isaiah 12, verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You see, our part is to trust. Our part is to think on Him. We are to think and let the facts of Christ and the facts of Scripture sink into our emotion and dispel over our fears. You need to filter 
what goes through your mind. God has given you a sound mind, but some of you, you're not feeding your mind the right things. Like I mentioned previously, please take time, especially if you have some extra time to get in the Bible and let the Bible get into you. God has given us a sound mind. He tells us to cast down imaginations and every high thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When those thoughts run through your mind, when those fears run through your minds, you check it by the Scriptures. And if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Check it. If it's not right, think on these things, Philippians 4, 7, and 8. The things that are true and just. Memorize a verse of Scripture. Quote the verse of Scripture. Filter your thinking. Lost people should be afraid at this point. If they're not saved, they should be afraid of dying. I used an opportunity at the store the other day. I asked the lady, or I, I said, do you know what's worse than the coronavirus? She looked at me kind of weird. I said, the sin virus. And I talked to her a little bit about Jesus, and she admitted that he was in control, and she admitted that, yeah, sin is a bad thing. And I told her, the worst thing about the sin virus is that people that don't get their sins forgiven have to pay for those sins in hell. And someone who's not saved, that should scare them. Jesus said, Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Now if you're saved, you shouldn't let fear rule you. You should not let fear run you. There was a little girl and she was at the end of the day, she was running from her friends going home. And she ran by a girl, and she was running into the cemetery. It was getting toward dark. And the little girl was like, what are you, the other little girl was like, what are you doing running to the cemetery? It's about to get dark. Aren't you scared to go? She said, no, my house is just on the other side of that. And that's how it is with us. We're going through life here, and no matter what we face in our culture, our society, in our world, we're just running through life. This world is not our home. And we do have to go through the cemeteries of this life. And we're going to get on the other side. We're going to get through this by God's grace. And the Lord's going to take us through this. And God will give you the ability to be calm and the ability not to panic and to be rational and not jump to conclusions and run on rumors you heard from someone that heard from someone that, you know, 1,500 people across the street from you have the, the virus, or you heard from this, or you heard from this, and then you begin to run your mouth, and you forget all those verses that talk about being a tailbearer, and all those verses that talk about the tongue and how it's a world of fire, and you forget all those admonitions not to be foolish and run your mouth, and you listen to all this stuff instead of saying, let me be rational. Okay, I'll do what the authorities are telling us to do. I'll try to obey the powers that be. And I will also use this as an opportunity to let people that are panicking and filled with fright realize that there's more to life than just this life. There's eternal life. And without Jesus Christ, there's no hope in this crisis or in any other crisis, especially the crisis of death and life after death. There is no hope without Jesus Christ. Church, we have hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of this one verse. I pray that you may bless us as we contemplate this one passage, that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that they would overcome their fears by trusting in your word and by having faith. And Lord, we pray that you may help those that are not saved to realize there is something way worse than this virus, that if they're not saved, they need to trust Christ before it's too late. Lord, help us to be a good testimony and help us, God, to have a sound mind, to trust in you, to think the right things, to monitor what we watch and how much 
of this we consume. Lord, help us to be mindful and obedient of authorities, but Lord, also help us to put you first in our lives and to have faith instead of fear. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. I pray that you may bless us, help us. God, we do pray for those that have been touched by this. Lord, it's not a, a joking matter. It's not a, a thing that is to be taken lightly. We pray for the health care providers. We pray for those that are in harm's way, that you may help them, God. Have mercy. And God, it's only by your mercy that we get through this or any other problems in life. And we ask for that and we beg for that. Lord, we are so uh, minute. We are so... Uh, vulnerable Lord, we are so fragile. And God, we just ask for your help. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.